Have you ever attended a meal where there was assigned seating? Have you ever had to plan a meal or an event where there was assigned seating? You might discover that that's not as easy of a task as you might think. And it's possible, like at a wedding reception, for example, that the bride and groom have spent hours, if not days, uh, working on a seating chart, a seating assignment, so that all of the guests would be comfortable. Because after all, you want things at the table to click, not clash, which always kind of makes me wonder now why I've been seated at a specific table. I, I don't know. <laughs> the setting of John chapter 12 is a meal. And, and while there is a difference of opinion as to whose house this meal was uh, at, uh, John simply tells us in the first verse, Jesus therefore six, day, six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And the phrase where Lazarus was probably means where Lazarus lived. So it's possible that this meal took place in the home of Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. But Matthew and Mark add some information that this meal was probably at the home of a man identified as Simon the leper. Who the Bible says he is, it really doesn't. Uh, it is conjectured that he may have been the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, or possibly even the husband of Martha. All we know is that for sure is that this Simon lived in Bethany, and John describes him as a leper. Now, based on the Old Testament law, Simon the leper could not have been leprous at the time Jesus visited his house. According to Leviticus 13, lepers were considered unclean and had to live outside the camp uh, alone and couldn't dwell inside a house. Anyone who had attended a meal with a leper would have also been considered unclean. So while it's speculative, it's not out of the possibility that Simon the leper was just one of the many hundreds of people that Jesus had healed. And so it's possible that Simon the cured leper had invited Jesus and his disciples into his home along with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And while there doesn't appear to be assigned seating, this meal in, this meal in John 12 is significant. John specifically tells us when it was held, six days before the Passover. This would mark the last week of Christ's life before the crucifixion. In fact, almost one half of John's gospel is given to that week. The timing is significant, and John 12 has been called the centerpiece of John's gospel because not only had Jesus just raised his friend Lazarus from the grave, climaxing his public ministry, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that Jesus was probably at an all-time high with his influence and popularity. But the 12th chapter is also a window in what lies ahead because it signals the arrival of this hour that's coming, the hour of Jesus' death on the cross. And so it's, it's a pivot point that begins a sequence of events in the life of Jesus that culminates in his death. Considering that Jesus knew what was coming, I, I find it kind of remarkable that he was even willing to attend this meal. It would have been completely understandable if, on the other hand, instead of wanting to socialize at all, he had decided to withdraw and seek some privacy and solitude. But he came. He was a guest of honor. The meal was for him. There is a sense, though, that the people at this meal are representatives of his ministry. It reminds me of a drama in which the larger story is broken down into smaller scenes featuring specific people. For example, John tells us in verse 2, so they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Who was it that came to dinner? Well, John tells us, first of all, that there's Martha, the server. I don't know about you, but when you go to your favorite restaurant and someone was to ask you how your meal was, you might tend to describe the ambiance of the room, uh, perhaps the food, maybe even a comment on how expensive it was. <laughs> Uh, you know, we might say, man, the steak was, was awesome. It was cooked to perfection. But let me tell you about my server. I confess that, though, which is usually the case, when the waiter or waitress introduces themselves and tells me their, their name and says, I'm here to, uh, to take care of you today, 
Um, I like the idea that for a moment I'm going to be taken care of, but honestly, usually by the end of the meal, I can't tell you what their name was. Now, I am totally aware of my lack of attentiveness and recognize my need for improvement. But even if I remembered their name and you were to ask me how the meal was, I'm not certain that I would have mentioned their name. John, however, mentions the fact that Martha was serving. She could have been, maybe, probably, was the hostess of this meal. But you know, this isn't the first time that we encounter Martha serving. On a previous occasion, Jesus went to Martha's home, and the Bible says, Now as they were traveling alone, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word, but Martha was distracted with all of her preparations. So she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I want you to understand that serving isn't what Martha did. Serving is who Martha was. In fact, the word serving here is the word from which we get our English word deacon or or ministry. Serving was how Martha ministered to Jesus. And I want to say thank God for the Marthas in the body of Christ who faithfully serve him often behind the scenes with very little recognition. Without them, the body of Christ and the ministry of the church would be seriously lacking. So at this meal is Martha the server. And then we're introduced to Lazarus the gravy merger. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Now we need to stop and think about the significance of this statement. This meal was for Jesus, but part of the reason this for this meal was also about Lazarus. Why? Because just a short time earlier, the body of Lazarus was decomposing in a tomb, but now he's alive. Not zombie alive, but really fully alive, resurrected and restored, eating a meal with Jesus. Do you remember the accounts of the events that transpired? When Jesus first received the message from Mary and Martha, Lord, behold, whom you love is sick. He didn't immediately leave the place he was, but he deliberately stayed for another couple of days. The Bible says, then he said, and, a, and then he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking a literal sleep. So then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. By the time that Jesus arrived, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And when his sisters heard that Jesus finally had arrived, they both, on separate occasions, echoed the same confession. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I know that this is speculative on my part, but but I see or hear in that confession both an affirmation of faith and an expression of confusion. Both sisters believed that if Jesus had arrived in time, that he could have healed Lazarus. Jesus had healed many people during his ministry, including the sick and the blind and the lame and and even those who were demon-possessed. So there was little, if any, doubt as to the power of Jesus to make Lazarus well if he had just arrived in time. But he didn't. And now it's too late. Lazarus is dead, and his body has already begun the process of decay. If you had been here, it may have been an expression of confusion. Lord, if you had been here, but why weren't you? Where were you when we really needed you? Has that question ever crossed your mind? Jesus told Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Mary and Martha do not demonstrate a lack of faith in Jesus, but perhaps a lack of grasping the full extent of the power of God. They believe that he was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, but they are now going to witness that he is God the Son. He is the one of whom John described in the beginning of his Gospels, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And then listen to this. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Yes, Jesus could have healed Lazarus. But Jesus didn't come to the tomb to do a healing. He came to do a resurrection. And when they took him to the tomb and removed the stone that blocked the entrance, the Bible says, then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says the man who had died came forth bound with hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I have no way of proving this, but I remember, I remember someone commenting on this passage and said the reason that Jesus called Lazarus by name is because if he had just said, come forth, then, then everyone would have come forth from the grave. The resurrection of Lazarus was the, the pinnacle of Christ's miracles, the, the climax of his ministry, but it's also a preview of his own resurrection from the grave. And so reclining at this table, eating at this table with Jesus is Lazarus. Not Lazarus the corpse, Lazarus very much alive. And so down in verse 9, we'll, we read a little bit later, the large crowd of Jews that learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. I don't know if this group was a part of the meal or if they're just a contingent that shows up later on towards the end, but they came. They came not only to see Jesus, but they came to see Lazarus, exhibit A of God's resurrection power. He had been dead, and now he's alive. Let me draw a comparison, each of us. We, we believe the Scripture teaches that because Jesus rose from the grave, we too will rise from the grave. But this picture of moving from death to life has another application as well. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ." For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. You see, every believer of Jesus Christ is a grave emerger. All of us are a witness and a testimony to the power of God to take us from death to life. So at this meal is Mary the server, Lazarus the grave emerger, and Mary the worshiper. Look at verse 3. Mary took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, many of you are familiar with this story. At some point during the meal, Mary takes some very expensive ointment, uh, anoints the feet of Jesus, and wipes them with her hair. I just want to say up front that what Mary did was bold, and it was lavish, and it was extravagant. Warren Wearsby describes it as an act of love and worship, which was public, spontaneous, sacrificial, lavish, personal, and unembarrassed. There are several features of what Mary did. 
including the humility of washing the feet of Jesus, usually a task assigned to the lowliest slave. Wiping his feet with her hair, which would have meant that she would have let her hair down in public, something a, a Jewish woman would rarely do. But Mary doesn't stop to calculate public reaction or allow it to keep her from expressing her devotion to the Lord. But the one thing that seemed to attract most of the attention of, about what she did was the extravagance of her act. John says she took a pound of very costly perfume. I was curious as to what today is considered the most expensive perfume in the world. So according to one source, it is DKNY Golden Delicious Million Dollar Fragrance Bottle. It's worth a million bucks. And the main reason of the exorbitant price is really not about the perfume as it is the one-of-a-kind bottle that contains a 2.43 carat yellow canary diamond in the cap, as well as other diamonds, sapphires, rubies, and other precious stones. Now, whether Mary's perfume would have made the list of the most expensive perfumes in the world, I can't say. But John describes it in terms of value and cost and quality. How expensive was that perfume? Well, Judas assesses the value at 300 denarii plus, and 300 denarii was equivalent to a year's wage of a common laborer. In the United States today, the average common labor gross salary is almost $55,000 or $26 an hour. But to help you appreciate it a little more, if that perfume were equivalent to your yearly income, how expensive would it be? What Mary did was sacrificial and involved great personal cost, but was also very extravagant. I taught one time on this passage, and I made the comment, and someone got, well, someone got upset at me because I, I, I made the comment, pointed out that Mary did not sell this perfume and use the money for ministry. She didn't use it for poor. She didn't use it for missions. She wasted it on Jesus. And what the person heard me say was, that I was not in support of missions. That's, that's not what I meant. Listen, our church has historically and generously and continues to give to missions. But what we need to grasp is that Mary's act is an act of devotion and love and worship. And when it came to her Savior, she held nothing back. Spurgeon's commented that it was very costly, but it had not cost a penny too much now that it could be used upon him. There was a pound of it, but there was none too much for him. It was very sweet, but none too sweet for him. You know, when I, when I watch what she did, I'm personally challenged. And I have to ask, does my devotion and love and worship for Jesus drive me the same way? It reminds me of the story of a of a, of a pastor of a rural, in a rural community, a church in a rural community, and he paid a visit to one of the farmers whose wife was a, a faithful attender, but he seldom came to church. And in the course of their conversation, the pastor said, John, if you had 100 cattle, would you give them to the Lord? Oh, yes, pastor, if I had 100 cattle, I would give them to the Lord. And if you had 50 sheep, would you give them to the Lord? Oh, yes, pastor, if I had 50 sheep, I would give them to the Lord. Well, well what if you had 10 horses? Would you give them to the Lord? Absolutely, Pastor. If I had 10 horses, I'd give them to the Lord. John, if you, if you had one pig, would you give it to the Lord? That's not fair, preacher. You know I have a pig. You see, it's easy to talk about what we would do. Do we really grasp the significance of what Mary did? Someone observed that the life of Mary is painted for us in three memorable pictures, each one where she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and learned. In John 11, she feels, fell at the feet of Jesus and surrendered. And here in John 12, she anoints the feet of Jesus and worships. See, I think Mary teaches something about the true nature of worship. If Jesus is the object of our worship, then there is nothing too extravagant or lavish. We'll never be able to repay him for what he did on the cross. And the amazing thing is he doesn't demand that we try. What he did, he did out of his incomparable grace and mercy and love. 
He died that we might live, and he gave it to us as a gift. But what should our response be to that kind of love? I think it's summarized well by a brother who once said, if Jesus willingly died on the cross to forgive me of my sins, how can I not give him my life in return? I've used this short poem from Christina Rossetti before, but she says, what can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him? Give him my heart. Mary's anointing was sacrificial, costly, and extravagant, but it's also insightful. Not everyone, as we'll see in just a moment, is on board with what she did. In fact, she gets criticized for it. But notice what Jesus says in verse 7. Therefore Jesus said, Let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you do not always have the poor, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Now, I don't know for certain, but other than Jesus, who certainly knew what was coming, Mary may have been the only one who really grasped what was happening. So there is a sense in which she's showing her devotion to Jesus before it's too late. This isn't just any perfume. This is funeral perfume. Normally, you wouldn't anoint the feet of a living person. You would rather anoint the head. You would anoint the feet of a corpse while you were preparing it for burial. Now, it's very possible, according to other gospel writers, that she anointed his head as well. Whatever her awareness, Jesus attaches her anointing to his impending death. The cross is ahead, and Mary seemed to some way understand that the end is coming. Her anointing, again, is that private point because the feast celebrating the resurrection of Lazarus now took on a more serious and solemn tone. The anointing inaugurates the final sequence of events in Jesus' life. So at this meal is Martha the server, Lazarus the gravy merger, Mary the worshiper, and Judas the betrayer. Verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. In the beginning of his gospel, John wrote of Jesus, he was in the world and the world would was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. It, it is a truth, a theme that is demonstrated over and over and over again in the life of Jesus, uh, of people in general, the religious leaders more specifically, and even now in the life of one of his own disciples, Judas. Judas was a disciple of Jesus, but he was not a believer in Jesus. Judas had never experienced the spiritual birth that he needed in order to enter the kingdom of God. To put it in the Bible's words, Judas wasn't saved. He may have had the appearance of outward morality, but he did not have genuine faith in Jesus. He hid his darkness of the heart from everyone except our Lord. Outward appearances, folks, can often deceive. Many people have a religious facade that hides who they really are. John mentions Judas eight times in his gospel. And almost every time, he connects Judas Iscariot with the betrayal of Jesus. In this chapter, though, it's the first time that John actually comments on his character, and he calls him a thief. I uh, found this fictitious letter from a consulting firm. It said, thank you for submitting the resumes for the 12 men that you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, and we have not only run them through our computer, but also arranged for personal interviews for each of them with our psychologists and vocational aptitude consultants. The profiles of all the tests are included, and you'll want to study each of them carefully. As a part of our service for your guidance, we make some general comments. It is the staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background education, and vocational aptitudes for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not seem to have a team concept. 
we would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capabilities. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interests above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of absolute ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. <laughs> Sincerely, the Jordan Management Consultants. Well, Judas evidently, evidently was the group's treasurer. And from time to time, he would help himself to what was in the money box. Listen, what makes a person a thief is not the amount. It's the act of stealing. And I am fascinated by what Judas hoped to financially gain by following Jesus. None of the disciples that I know, except maybe with the possibility of Matthew, would have had much money. Jesus, though he's the creator of all that there is, certainly was not wealthy. He was a traveling, itinerant preacher who didn't even really have a home base. In fact, at one point he said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In fact, Jesus made it clear that following him was not going to result in financial gain, but just the opposite. It was going to cost something. His words, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me almost seem strange, even bizarre in this contemporary expression of Christianity. Joining with a rabbi like Jesus was not going to be financially lucrative. So it makes you wonder, what was it that motivated Judas Iscariot to follow Jesus in the first place? What did he hope to gain? He's not going to control the finances of a multi-million dollar ministry. And in fact, he even stole from the meager resources of the disciple, which unmasked his true character. One commentary said, John makes it plain that Judas was not an unfortunate, misguided person. He was inherently an evil thief who had no concern for the poor. Thus, John would never agree with some modern portrayals of Judas as a traffic hero who merely, understood, who merely understood Jesus. I don't know. Perhaps what Mary did pushed him over the edge. Because when he protested at the waist, Jesus responded, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Words that sound more like rebuke than instruction. And whether it was the frustration of what happened at the dinner or the realization that holding the money box for Jesus and the disciples isn't really going to get him anywhere, Judas makes a decision to cut his loss and to get something out of the deal. And in the parallel accounts in Matthew and Mark seem to indicate that it was almost immediately after Mary's anointing that Judas left and made his deal with the Jewish authorities to hand over Jesus. Losing on one source... Of sordid gain, he immediately went out and set up another. And when he asked the religious leaders what they would pay, what they were willing to pay was 30 pieces of silver. Folks, that's what Jesus was worth to them. And Judas took it. The contrast between the value of Mary's gift and Judas' blood money is staggering. She poured out a year's income on his feet. And Judas sold him for about five weeks' worth. What a meal. It's filled with people of contrasting backstories. It represents how people responded to Jesus, how he had influenced the lives of people. 
but at some point both the privacy and the drama of this meal are interrupted. So let's go down to verse 9 again. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. John doesn't identify who these Jews are, but the context seems to indicate that they are not enemies of Jesus. They're perhaps more curious than anything because word had gotten out that Jesus and Lazarus are at this meal, and they came to see for themselves. The news of the resuscitation of Lazarus had an impact. And John says, as a result, because, uh, because an account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. The fact that Lazarus was alive contributes to the scene that soon follow on the day that we call Palm Sunday, where Jesus publicly proclaims himself as the Messiah and the crowds worship him as such. But for others, Lazarus is a loose end that needs to be dealt with. And John gives us a hint into the heart and the attitude of those who needed to find a way to put an end both to the ministry and the life of Jesus. The dinner has ended, but the stage has been set, and the drama is about to unfold. As I thought about this message, I thought, you know, if there had been a sign to seating, and I had been put next to one of these people at the meal based on common interests and affinity and whatever, who would I have been sitting by? How about you?